Hi, it's Tom Kraus, Polnius TV. My guest today is Dr. Michael Lloyd, uh, Senior Research Fellow, Global Policy Institute. Welcome to the program. Good morning, John. It's the uh, 21st of June, 2016. We meet here in Newcastle upon Tyne, and it's only two days left uh, uh, until uh, the referendum vote takes place. The campaign is uh, almost over. Uh, we've heard almost everything from both sides. Do you feel that all those arguments that were used during the campaign really properly addressed ordinary people's fears and, and worries? Well, not only that, I don't think the facts have come out very well at all. I think there's been much more heat rather than light generated. And I think people are confused rather than, in other words, the debate hasn't actually presented a clear view of either side. You've had exaggerated claims, hyperbole and misleading statements. So the campaign itself, I think, has been characterized by myths uh, and misinformation and misconceptions. The vote whether Britain should stay in the EU or uh, leave the EU should be more about economy than anything else. Uh, but it looks like uh, the main topic was immigration. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's, it, it, it's important to note that the Remain campaign has clearly been talking about the uh, economy and the economic impact of leaving and, uh, for that matter, the economic benefits of staying. But latterly, immigration, or rather migration, or rather free movement <laughs> of people within the EU has become a major topic. The problem is that people are worried about the numbers. I don't think the British people are generally racist or xenophobic. Uh, there are racists and xenophobes. But I think the main concern of people is how it affects them in their communities. But there's enormous exaggeration and misinformation. So, for instance, uh, almost half of the migration into the UK is of students coming to learn on university courses of three and four years. So only half of the 330,000 number, which, is, which was last year's figures, uh, are actually, have actually come in uh, to work. And I think, it, I, I, I think there are two things. One is the problems that people face are not due to uh, migrants coming in. They're due to a lack of government investment in housing, in social policy, in uh, school place, uh, provision of school places, etc. These are the problems. They clearly are worsened if you have numbers of people coming in. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is a lack of government investment. But how can you actually, how can you convince people uh, that better is to stay in the EU and try to reform it than to leave and have no influence on anything? Well, I think one of the issues, of course, is the economic downside of uh, leaving the UK. There is little question that there would be an immediate and probably quite, quite uh, severe shock to the economy. And because of the uncertainties, that may well go on. Don't forget, this, <clears throat> this decision is not simply about the UK. This decision, the decision that British people have to make on the 23rd, will affect the UK, it will affect the EU as a whole, and it will affect global policy as well. It looks like that uh, British people think that if they leave EU, they can leave all the problems the EU have behind. So it's like a separatism myth. Uh, let's leave the EU and the EU problems will not affect us. Don't you think that it's maybe a little bit naive because, you know, Britain as an isle is so close to Europe. Is it actually justified? Is it a justified belief? Will well, it happen? Britain is part of Europe. It's part of you geographically and culturally. Um, people don't always recognize this. That's partly, I think, because of the growth of what I regard as a kind of uh, rather unpleasant, uh, petty English nationalism, which has grown up over the last few years. But I think uh, attacks on the EU or blaming the EU, scape using the EU as a scapegoat for the problems which are inherent, in some cases solely within the UK, in terms of austerity policies and necessary ones, um, and also the problems of globalization. Change happens. And what you need to do is respond to that change by managing it, not by actually trying to run away from it, hide away from it, escape from it. There is no escape from the modern world. It, it creates problems, it creates tensions, it creates insecurities. It's the job of politicians and of governments to deal with those problems. 
if there is a vote for Brexit. The main concern of Polish community here in the UK is what will happen to obviously freedom of movement, uh, what will happen with people who are here already, and what will happen to people who would like to come here. What would you say to, to those people? Should they be actually afraid of, of things like that? Well, I think immediately, if there is a vote to leave, nothing uh, specific will happen uh, in relation to free movement. So the sun will shine on Friday as well. No, that's right. To free movement or migration. Um, uh, and in any case, all the people that are here now, nothing will happen. There will be no repatriation. That's been quite clear. Even the Leave side have made that point. People will not be sent back. Um, obviously, if you stop free movement, but that wouldn't stop for a couple of years anyway. Uh, and indeed, if the agreement, the trade agreement, is to uh, stay within the single market, then free movement wouldn't change in any case if a Norwegian-type deal is done. Um, but even if you, you, you take some of the leave uh, suggestions of a WTA, uh, WTO uh, trade deal, and free movement would, would, would cease eventually, uh, it won't cease completely because, in fact, uh, a rather bureaucratic work permit system or point system will be introduced. Um, and that will mean people will still be able to come where there are uh, needs for people to actually work here. So uh, my, migration and free movement is not going to stop, uh, even if there's a, a Brexit and Britain moves away or tries to move away. Uh, from the European Union. But I do understand the fears that, that um, uh, Polish people in, uh, you may have, and uh, uh, Poles are the largest uh, group within the UK, because Spanish and German colleagues of mine, teachers at universities, etc., are, are concerned about the, how, how people will react towards them as a result of the tone of the debate on migration, which has not been very attractive. And there are also a lot of British people uh, living in Europe, uh, particularly uh, in Spain. Yeah, they also worried a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you about maybe less economic point, but maybe more psychological point uh, about uh, leaving the EU. Because as you, I think, mentioned, it would be at least uh, several years, and I think it'll be at least two years, because according to Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, if there is a vote uh, to leave the EU, it will trigger two years of negotiation. It also uh, surprised me that I, ha I haven't heard the argument from the Leave side uh, that if people want to get a change, so if they actually vote to leave because they want to get a change, they won't get this change for at least two years or more. So if the Brexit campaigners are telling them that actually uh, something will change after they vote uh, to leave, I think the Remain campaigners should actually point it out straight away that it won't be at least for two years or more. And in two years' time, the situation Britain, in Britain, in Europe, economic situation, political situation, may be completely different. I think that's right. It, it, it would be a very uncertain time. Uh, some Leave campaigners have suggested that you abrogate uh, the, 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 the treaties immediately. That would not be something which would be done, I think. And some Remain campaigners have made that quite clear. I think Dominique Grieve, who was an ex-Attorney General, made, made that point, that it, it, this would be quite, quite, uh, quite unusual, shall I say, for British to abrogate treaties in that way. But it will be t it'll take two years plus because there are three things that have to be done on the trade side, for instance. First is to disentangle the UK from the EU. Second is to, is to negotiate a new trade deal of some sort with the uh, rest of the EU. And the third thing is to uh, negotiate trade deals with third countries uh, who won't necessarily be very positively inclined towards the UK. And the other issue which I don't think the Remain campaigners have actually made uh, clearly, uh, uh, stated it clearly enough. We are very competitive in terms of services. 30% of our, uh, about a third of our trade now, uh, exports, are in services. Uh, and a third of those go to the EU. That's the area where we're competitive. We have a surplus with the, uh, a 30 billion pound surplus with the EU in services that's going to be damaged considerably. Talking about how leaving the EU would affect uh, people's lives, 
George Soros uh, yesterday made quite an um, interesting comment that people apparently don't realize that leaving EU is not only about the immigration or macroeconomy, but that it will actually affect their own households and will affect their own financial position, that they may be actually worse off financially, uh, and that people don't realize that. Why do you think is that? I think it was absolutely true. I think um, concentration on I'm an economist, concentrating on the macroeconomic uh, sort of argument is one thing, but it needs to be made real to people and understand that prices will go up, their jobs may be threatened, their wages may be threatened. This it will have an impact. Uh, no question about that. Even Leave supporters agree that there will be an impact. Uh, Nigel Farage, for instance, said, well, it's a price worth paying. Oh, well, yeah, he won't have to pay it. It'll be, it'll be you know, workers in in, in, in this region, for instance, in the northeast, that will have to pay uh, for these sort of problems. So I think making this real and for people to understand that it will affect them in their daily lives, it will affect their jobs, it will affect their family income, etc. I think that is extremely important. And it may, people argue, okay, well, it's a shallow recession. Yes, but it may go on, actually, and it may get worse because no one really knows the, it's not just risks, it's uncertainties massive uncertainty, which may lead to a, a much longer period of recession than people are suggesting at the moment. Tragic incident from last week, uh, a, murder what, uh, a murder that happened, uh, Joe Cox, uh, Labour politician, uh, was murdered on the street. It actually left, uh, it actually had some impact on, on Polish immigrants and I believe on all immigrants here in the UK. W what's, your, what's your view on, on this? Was it like a one of incident like a mad person or is it, is it just something else starting? Yes, it, it was a tragic event that Joe Cox was, was killed by someone who uh, clearly whatever, although motivated by right-wing views, uh, is clearly, clearly deranged. You don't kill people unless you have some kind of psychopathic uh, uh, element in your makeup, not in the savage way in which that was done. Um, but I think the tone of the debate particularly in relation to migration and immigration, has, has not helped. And, it, and unfortunately, it, 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 I don't think it has a direct causal effect, but it's the surrounding debate is something which I, I, I think needs to be uh, carefully looked at. And perhaps uh, after the, the uh, referendum, and I think it has maybe changed the way in which politicians are approaching it, uh, since last Thursday. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. My guest today was uh, Dr. Michael Lloyd, Senior Research uh, Fellow at Global Policy Institute uh, in London. Thank you very much. Thank you.